there's an extremely interesting paradox that's at the heart of my own private Idaho. On the one hand, it's a highly original, indeed highly personal work. Um, rarely, if ever, at least in American commercial cinema, have we encountered a character like Mike Waters, or have we seen the kinds of dramatic situations that he gets himself into. I've been on this road before. This is my road. Moreover, his presence in the story is also augmented by a set of uh, visual devices uh, that are unusually subjective, and that these range from quick passages of poetic imagery to very abrupt scene transitions. And these techniques cut against the grain of even recent non-studio aesthetic practices. On the other hand, uh, it's a film that generates an extremely dense web of cultural references and allusions that conducts a dialogue not only with a bunch of other movies, but also with traditions of American culture and uh, American painting uh, that involve the image of the outcast and the landscape. According to Van Zandt, and I'm quoting here, America has a certain culture that's always reverting or trying to figure out where it comes from. In my own private Idaho, a film about origins and about future possibilities, the director does exactly that. Uh, look for places where he can um, uh, discover something about his own personal, historical, and also cultural baggage. For starters, there are two touchstones of cinema that Van Zandt makes use of more than any other. That's the road movie and the western. And these two are not unrelated. My Own Private Idaho appeared in the early 90s as part of a small spate of revisionist road movies. That is, these were movies that uh, really transformed some of the values and the genre conventions that we know from road movies in the past. The road movie had typically had a very optimistic edge. Road movies were films about personal transformation. They were about self-discovery. They were about uh, being out in the landscape in such a way that uh, characters um, uh, came to realize things about themselves that allowed for not only um, a, a kind of personal reintegration with society, but also were in some sense uh, redemptive of larger communities. Road movies were also traditionally occasions for the bonding of very unlikely atypical pairs, and this is certainly the case with the revisionist road movies that came along in the 80s and 90s. The experience of being on the road, especially in the latter revisionist stage of road movies can be extremely unsettling. The open road is a place not so much for ordinary adventures, but for dreamlike occurrences, even supernatural appearances. Almost always, both in traditional Hollywood and then in independent productions of the 90s, road movies tell some kind of quest story. And they do so even when the object of the quest may be either uncertain or even unknown to the audience. Mom? Road movies are almost always as well about transition. In the 1990s, the mythic freedom of the road was appropriated by a number of younger directors as almost as a, a metonymy for the freedom of independent production itself. The road movie served as a kind of a generic hook for younger directors to explore new visual and narrative templates and also to bring into the foreground a certain uncharted social identities. Mike, yeah. I'm nice to run into you boys. How have you been? Good. See you later. For a second. According to Van Zandt, one reason why he was so fond of the road movie uh, is because it has a built-in beginning, middle, and ending so that it's got a structure into which you can throw all kinds of different characters and situations. Sinking of power. Every hour. For a while, it seemed as if there was a road movie for every possible identity grouping. 
Thelma and Louise, for instance, was widely hailed as a feminist road movie. Stranger Than Paradise claimed as a slacker road movie. Something Wild is the perfect office nerd road movie. Pow Wow Highway is one of several films that feature Native American characters. I won't even speculate about which identity grouping Natural Born Killers appeals to. The trajectory of the revisionist road movie really starts with Easy Rider in 1969, and it's followed up to a certain extent by Terrence Malick's Badlands in 1973. What really none of these films could anticipate uh, was the emergence of a gay male subset of uh, road movies that includes two films by West Coast provocateur Greg Araki, namely Doom Generation and um, The Living End, and also a rather surprising commercial success, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. It's true that critics have often contended that the road movie, even in early stages, has harbored certain homoerotic subtexts. And the evidence for these male-male longings goes back all the way to the Hope Crosby road pictures and extends forward all the way to a film like Dumb and Dumber. So the road movie and the western are both twin sites for exploring ingrained ideas about masculine identity and masculine self-realization. These are ideas that are continually linked with the landscape, with the idea of uh, the outcast as someone who mediates between culture and civilization, with the landscape as a place for testing uh, certain heroic values, or in a lot of cases, uh, negating, finding those values um, as somehow inadequate. Though experience of the wilderness in American film has habitually entailed characters who undergo some form of symbolic death and rebirth, a, a motif that's very obvious, I think, in uh, my own private Idaho. Richard Slotkin, a terrific cultural historian, has referred to this figure of the outcast and the idea of his death and rebirth as regeneration through violence, a society that kind of rebuilds itself or discovers itself um, through acts of violence committed uh, in the landscape. It's possible to see Mike Waters in my own private Idaho as a kind of deranged descendant of this very strong American literary and filmic tradition. In fact, the drifter as a primal American figure has frequently contained uh, the seeds of sexual deviance. The drifter is someone who um, uh, sexuality has involved something vaguely disreputable. And one of the things that Van, Van Zandt does, of course, is to kind of push the sexual ambiguity uh, through the transgressive figure of Mike as a male prostitute. So how's your wife? You're not very talkative tonight, man. That's cool. Where are we going? In another register, the road movie Western Nexus uh, often turns on some form of generational conflict uh, over social authority and authenticity. Um, and uh, this is the kind of, of conflict that I think um, uh, Van Zant understood from his deep affinities with beat literature, with a novel like Jack Kerouac's On the Road, but it also becomes a point of contact uh, for him to access Shakespeare's Henriad, which is one of the kind of classical, dramatic instances of generational conflict and rebellion. In Shakespeare's Henry plays, Prince Hal is a figure who defies his father's uh, most ardent wishes for him to follow in the footsteps of the kind of young and valorous knights, uh, such as his cousin Hotspur. What Hal does instead is immerse himself in this Falstaffian world of petty crime and drunkenness and whoring, which is a constant source of friction between father and son. We have a message for you from your father. He'd like to see you as soon as possible. Fuck you. And yet, after Hal reconciles with his father, as his father is approaching death, 
and um, assumes the crown, he tells us that all along this had been his plan, that he really didn't have much allegiance I mean, to Falstaff great. and um, his band wow. of uh, loose, unrestrained companions, as Shakespeare puts it. I don't know you, old man. Please leave me alone. So what Van Zant does is take the figure of Hal and invest him in this figure of Scott Favor, someone who has uh, transgressed his father's uh, middle class values in a way that, if anything, is even more severe uh, than what Shakespeare's character did. Of course, if the guy can pay me, then hell yeah, here I am for him. I'll sell my ass, do it on the street occasionally for cash. Like Prince Hal, Scott seems to indicate after his uh, kind of newfound belief in the system, as it were, he was perfectly willing to leave the anarchic, freedom-loving world of uh, Bob and his band. I was planning a change. There was a time when I had the need to learn from you, my former and psychedelic teacher. And although I love you more dearly than my dead father, I have to turn away. And yet we can also see, I think, just how much Scott misses that world. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And then through Shakespeare's Henriad, um, uh, to meditate on the character of Orson Welles as the archetypal Hollywood rebel, the outcast. My Own Private Idaho is more than just two movies in one, it's really a bunch of movies in one. Um, but the movie that I think it makes, uh, uh, has a kind of primary relationship to, is Wells's Falstaff, uh, a film in which uh, Wells used the figure of Falstaff to allegorize his own um, sense of betrayal at the hands of former Hollywood supporters. And I think that the Falstaff figure is translated, or retranslated, by Van Zandt into a figure that can also express something of his own personal history and his sense of involvement in American film. We have heard the chimes at midnight. That we have. That we have. In fact, Bob, we have. So My Own Private Idaho then becomes a narrative in which some of this cultural baggage, some of Van Zandt's relationship to the past can be worked out. And needless to say, this is not, a, as it were, a straight narrative. Uh, it's a narrative filled with detours, with gaps, um, uh, with uncertainties, and with destinations that are, I think, never really clear, even after the film has kind of reached some form of resolution. This road will never end. The figure of Mike isn't uh, uh, totally without precedent. Van Zandt draws sustenance from some of Andy Warhol's and Paul Morrissey's male hustler figures from the 1960s. Mike also has a relationship to Van Zandt's previous nomadic figures in films like Malanoche and also uh, Drugstore Cowboy. Malanoche is primarily a film about the uh, infatuation of an older man uh, with a young immigrant worker. But it's a film that has some of the same kind of sense of drifting, especially in the urban environment, that I think is conveyed in my own private Idaho. Drugstore Cowboy is a film that does make a transition out of the urban into the, or at least the modern equivalent of the wilderness, this time as triggered by a death and a strong involvement with the drug trade. And in a way, it clearly anticipates Van Zandt's next project, Even Cowgirls Get the Blues, which is at least a, a hint of what might be called a lesbian road movie. All of these character types are part of a uh, wider revaluation of the outcast figure and the idea of the frontier wilderness uh, that um, took place in American cinema uh, well before Van Zandt arrived on the screen. The codes of the Western hero were being revised and transformed as far back as the 1950s in films by John Ford and Anthony Mann, among others. And then more recently, Easy Rider 
recast some of those same figures in a kind of modern drag. And it's, I don't think it's coincidental that the last shot of Easy Rider, which is a long crane shot away from the mayhem of the road uh, where the two travelers have been killed, is at least alluded to in the last shot or the last scene of uh, My Own Private Idaho. In fact, one of the interesting things that Van Zandt uh, has said in an interview is that he regards all of his films as versions or as modern westerns. Clearly the best example of a play on western conventions is the central campfire scene between Mike and Scott. In Idaho, Van Zant really pushes the cowboy vibes of that campfire scene in a number of ways. For instance, on the soundtrack, he includes the howling of coyotes, uh, a sound of a train whistle, and Indian chanting very faintly in the background. I'd like to talk with you. I mean, I'd like to uh, really talk with you. Now, the campfire scene, in endless numbers of westerns, was an occasion for cowboys at night to sit around and reveal what passed for personal reflections, um, to express some kind of doubt or perhaps regret uh, over something that happened in the past, and even in a few films to deliver something like monosyllabic philosophical statements. If I had a normal family, and a good upbringing, then I would have been a well-adjusted person. <laughs> Depends on what you call normal. Yeah, it does. During that campfire scene, which is all about normality, about what's a normal home life, Mike talks about looking for a home, um, specifically um, uh, going on a search um, uh, to find his mother. But as Michael eventually discover in a kind of very dark twist on The Wizard of Oz, yet another reference that uh, Van Zandt draws in Idaho, there's no place like home, at least for him. Or, to put it differently, uh, there is no home, any place, for Mike. That's all right. I don't feel sorry for myself. I, mean, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm, you know, well adjusted. This is also a scene in which Mike declares his love for Scott, it's certainly something that we wouldn't expect uh, John Wayne or Jimmy Stewart to do in any classical campfire scene. I love you, though. You know that. I do love you. And this declaration of love in some ways sounds like it was scripted by the literary critic Leslie Fiedler, who was among the first to discover homosocial relationships in classical American wilderness literature. The dyad of Mike and Scott also can be taken as a kind of very interesting version of um, uh, the subjects in a rite of passage. Coming of age tale, to be sure, uh, but it's also fused with a, um, a declaration of romantic love as one legitimate form of male bonding. So if there's a passage in this film through the wilderness to something grander, to something more stable, it's a passage that Mike um, is unable to make or unwilling to make, um, unlike uh, rites of passage uh, in both industrial and tribal societies. Mike is stuck in the landscape. Look, I just know that I've been here before. I just know that I've been stuck here. Like this one fucking time before, you know that? Yeah. As someone attempting to go through a wilderness passage, uh, Mike is not only stuck in the landscape, as he puts it, but he's also stuck in his own marginal subculture of urban gay hustlers. The anthropologist Victor Turner uh, used the term liminality to refer to that uh, stage of ritual in which people are suspended between two worlds, between uh, the kind of absolute raw edge of the wilderness 
and established codes of society. And it seems to me that liminality is a very good term to apply to the journey structure of my own private Idaho. In liminality, in which a uh, character is suspended neither here nor there, there's a considerable amount of role playing involved. And at least according to Turner, uh, liminality allows for certain kinds of behaviors, especially sexual behaviors, that would be denied to citizens of fixed status, citizens who were kind of part of an established social code. Some of the liberty uh, that uh, Mike experiences as this liminal creature also prevents him from achieving something like long-term happiness. A quite different fate is in store for Mike's love object and road buddy and alter ego, Scott, uh, who is able to um, undertake a smooth, perhaps even calculated transition through the liminal state into a kind of form of a social ascendance. In essence, what Scott goes through is a transition from adolescence to adulthood, from poverty to affluence, from a homosexual to a heterosexual affiliation, and also from a state of complete indolence to one of industry. And you can see that especially at the end of the film when we see not only Scott involved in business, but also potentially in politics. Scott, you ever considered a political career? Part of Van Zandt's method is to juxtapose um, a community of democratic, perhaps even utopian values of the street hustlers and especially the world of Bob with the favors version of a hierarchical, patriarchal world of sexual difference, of social power, of affluence. And it's not always clear where Van Zandt's sympathies lie. Or, I guess to put it differently, Van Zandt is at once Scott and Mike. He sympathizes with Mike. He even sees Mike, perhaps, as a former version, or a very much fictionalized and idealized version of himself. And yet, he is also very clearly Scott, someone of intense ambition, someone who's in the process of making a transition out of that kind of freewheeling, independent movie-making world into something much more established, uh, namely that kind of fixed status of Hollywood commercial films. For Scott, as for his literary model, Prince Hal, the streets, or, you know, in Shakespeare's time, the bawdy houses and taverns, are really just a sort of intermediate episode, a, a testing ground in preparation for Scott's assumption of his rightful social niche. I will change when everybody expects it the least. <laughs> You'll become a head roller, a hatchet man for your old man. Mike, however, the helpless um, road non-warrior ultimately gets his due in the film. Um, although his search for his mom is something of a thin premise, I think, almost a MacGuffin, since even finding mom would in no way redeem Mike's life, at least as what we see of it in the film. Don't you talk to me like that! <laughs> it is his lapses his physiological and mental lapses that really control the pace and control the rhythm of the film. So in this sense, even though Scott may ultimately triumph in the end by getting out of that kind of morass of, of, of uh, wilderness identity, um, Mike clearly leaves his impression on the overall structure and texture of the film. I'm a connoisseur of roads. been tasting roads my whole life. So if Van Zandt sympathizes with Mike and even celebrates something of the irresponsible anti-establishment attitudes uh, that Mike holds, albeit often inadvertently, he also in some sense mirrors in the kinds of visual techniques he chooses Mike's improvisatory approach to the world. In fact, the actor, River Phoenix, improvised a number of scenes, and very specifically, uh, Van Zandt said he rewrote that central campfire scene. I really want to kiss you. So it's possible to think of Van Zandt's career at this point 
as um, uh, going through a process of uh, liminal transition from the independent world of filmmaking to the Hollywood world. However, unlike Mike, who's an incredibly non-introspective character, Van Zandt himself, as a director, as, the, as uh, the authorial voice of the film, is clearly not only self-reflective, uh, but he's also uh, kind of burdened with a rather large historical consciousness and uh, the kind of ambition uh, that his character Scott manifests uh, certainly toward the second half of the film. Van Zandt winds up restoring something of Shakespeare's original subversive edge in this Falstaff character. And he does so not only through humor, but also through installing uh, uh, a very explicit idea about class hostility. The Falstaff character, Bob, says to uh, Scott uh, in the most obvious way possible that Scott's going to be Bob's ticket out of poverty and oppression. Do you think that I would kill the heir apparent? You think I would turn on you, Scotty? Why, you're our only ticket out of this poverty and oppression. This idea of uh, class antagonism is something that I think uh, had gotten lost in the many translations of the Falstaff uh, figure over time, including the translation made by Orson Welles. And I think that uh, that's something that is uh, much to Van Zandt's credit here. By the time Wells came to make Falstaff, he hadn't worked in Hollywood for over six years, and although he kept thinking that he might be able to stage a triumphant return, he would never work in Hollywood again. By all accounts, the pr production of Falstaff in Europe in 1964 and 1965 uh, was disordered at best, a disaster at worst. Uh, Wells had cobbled together a script from five separate Shakespeare plays. Uh, he was forced to shoot in scattered, sometimes improvised locations, uh, using well-known actors who were flown in um, under cover at night since they were officially under contract to other productions. Falstaff opened in the United States in 1967 amidst um, all of the, you know, by now famous uh, upheavals of that time, and it was regarded uh, in one of two ways, as either uh, a yet another instance of rebellious anti-Hollywood energies, or as testimony to the elitist wisdom of the European art film, uh, then at just about its peak in American popularity. In retrospect, um, Falstaff is obviously Orson Welles' parable of his own betrayal uh, by former Hollywood industry supporters and a vision of his expulsion from that magical kingdom. At the same time, it's also a middle-aged artist's very heartfelt defense of what were uh, once uh, held as his legendary creative abilities. Wells follows Shakespeare by using Falstaff as a mask with which to skewer certain pieties and codes of manly honor. In Shakespeare's time, the figure of Falstaff, that dissolute knight, uh, was taken by audiences to be a clear affront um, to the idea of inherited wealth and power. Now, it turns out that uh, a number of Wells' earlier films offer very sharp critiques of inherited power, films such as Citizen Kane, or in the case of official rather than inherited power, uh, Touch of Evil. These are also films that I think display considerable sympathy toward uh, young men forced to grow up under the yoke of so-called adult responsibilities. That's a theme, for instance, in Magnificent Ambersons. And I think it's also worth noting that Wells's films are rife with family betrayals with surrogate parental roles. Something else that I think uh, might well have appealed to Van Zandt uh, when he was undertaking this project. I think my friends can see that I am back from Boise. And the listener! And more than that, my real father. Consciously or not, Van Zandt follows the model that Wells provided for, uh, with Falstaff in a number of different ways. Van Zandt 
reports that the script was the product of three different incarnations, and that doesn't count his verbatim borrowings from Shakespeare or the kind of twisted versions of dialogue that he takes from Shakespeare. I said there were four, Scott. Four. Now these four came from the front, kicking at me, pulling their knives, and I whipped out the blade and took all seven as a target. Like this. Seven? But just a second ago, there were four. In leather? No, Bob, my friend. There was four of them, and they all had leather on. Seven, by my count. And in addition, there are passages in my own private Idaho that are shot-for-shot shot recreations of scenes from Wells's film. This kind of imitative quirk would be something that Van Zandt uh, would explore most fully in his version of Psycho, uh, which uh, literally takes Hitchcock's film and remakes it camera angle for camera angle, cut for cut. Van Zandt's own somewhat difficult uh, production process leaves an imprint, I think, in the viewer's experience, especially insofar as we understand this film to be a film of, of uh, starts and stops, a film of discursive leaps from one kind of style or one kind of verbal presentation to another, as if this is a film that's been composed of short, almost irreconcilable scenes. My mom's house was blue. No, it was great. It was great. How could I forget that? Continuity is an issue in this film, and I think it's an issue on a number of different levels. There are clashing visual and verbal styles in this film that don't so much echo Wells as suggest the dense cultural baggage that Van Zandt has assembled here. For instance, we get what seem like ad hoc, almost cinema verite interviews with some of the young male hustlers in Portland. He starts getting naked and jacking off and shit. And I start getting freaked out. And I say, nah, you know, I don't want to do this date, you know. I say, let's go down to the street and I'll get the money back from my friend Scott and we'll just, we'll cancel it, right? So we go down to the street to get the money back and Scott's like long gone. We also, at the other end of the spectrum, get scenes of melodramatic excess, as in Bob's death scene. God! God! We get straight realist recording, and on the other hand, we get um, uh, scenes that are kind of clearly the product of uh, spontaneous improvisation. In terms of uh, verbal address, Van Zandt explores a range that encompasses everything from um, street kids' inarticulate, rough trade talk. You know, I just, I just want total control of my music. I want to engineer it. I want to mix it. And, you know, I want to. I want to get my own say on opening bands. Then I'd like to like stand in back of bigger pictures of myself. That's good. To Elizabethan Falstaffian bombast. Oh. Breath to utter what lies in the tailor's yard, stick, you boot case, you vile punk! Oh, breathe a while, and then do it again. But hear me out. There are also lyrical passages, almost pastoral, especially in the scenes in Italy. And on the other hand, there are moments of very intense, almost abstract montage. These visual and verbal incongruities are um, extended, even made more forceful, I think, by uh, shifting styles in uh, music that, uh, that Van Zandt selects. <laughs> to my mind, at least, Van Zandt adopts these kind of clashing modes, not out of some postmodern agenda, um, not to try to create that very fashionable sense of pastiche that infected independent films, especially in the early 90s, but rather out of a very personal motivation to explore some of the cultural baggage that he feels most attached to. Think about two scenes at uh, diametrically opposite ends of the film. 
first that remarkable disjunctive opening scene of Mike out on the highway with its kind of strange rhythms and its insertions of imagery of salmon or the crashing barn during Mike's narcoleptic blackout. And this is a scene that plays like some kind of odd combination of Hitchcock's North by Northwest and Dolly and Bunuel's Shenandelu. At the other end of the film, there's the double funeral scene, the official funeral of Jack Favor uh, and the kind of unofficial riotous celebration around Bob's interment. Interestingly, Van Zandt frames these two parallel events using very, very different visual means. In the first instance, in the Favor funeral, um, predictably, there are a lot of very stable shots, very kind of sober framing. And then for Bob's funeral, the opposite is true. Handheld shots, peculiar camera angles that are expressive of the anarchic spirit of, of Bob himself. Van Zandt's relationship to Orson Welles' Falstaff is not at all straightforward. In fact, one can say that he uh, filters Falstaff um, through a, uh, a notion of post-60s American sexual revolution. What time is it? What do you care? Well, you wouldn't even look at a clock unless hours were lines of coke. Dials look like the signs of gay bars. Or time itself was a fair hustler. Black leather. Isn't that right, Bob? To put it crudely, Van Zandt does something like out uh, Shakespeare's Falstaff tale as retold by Wells under different circumstances for his own purposes. In doing so, Van Zandt, perhaps inadvertently, reveals something very telling about um, some of Orson Welles' previous films. A peculiar aspect of Welles' previous films is that his male relationships tend to be stronger than male-female contacts. He tends to shy away from sexual scenes uh, and indeed um, a number of his films um, develop kind of quite odd and albeit uh, affecting um, relationships between men. If you think of Charlie Kane and Jed Leland in Citizen Kane or Hank Quinlan and his partner Menzies in Touch of Evil, these are relationships that um, uh, uh, could be thought of as having some kind of undertow of um, uh, homoerotic desire. Hence, by making the Falstaff Hal liaison explicit, Van Zandt allows us to see something that perhaps hasn't really been talked about in Wells's amazing career. Wells was something of a movie autodidact. He really pretty much taught himself the uh, rudimentary techniques of filmmaking. He came, as most people know, from a brilliant stage career where he worshipped Shakespeare, not just as a dramatic master, but also as a model for the negotiation between art and commerce, between personal expression and popular culture. And of course, sadly, this was a negotiation that Wells himself failed at miserably. And that this failure, I believe, also might have contributed to making Wells and uh, Wells' Falstaff story, uh, an intriguing point of contact for Van Zandt in my own private Idaho. For Wells, Shakespeare was the king of drama, and if he had one grand ambition, it was to try to translate Shakespeare into uh, the popular medium of film. Unfortunately, as we know, Wells was uh, expelled from Hollywood before he could realize or fully realize this ambition. And I think Van Zandt identifies not only with the desire to bring Shakespeare uh, to a popular American audience, but also with Wells' expulsion. It's ironic in this regard that although Wells had no real filmic masters, no father figures who kind of nurtured um, his cinematic technique, uh, Wells himself uh, spawned any number of offspring everyone from Scorsese to Spielberg to younger directors like Tim Burton, um, uh, even Oliver Stone. Thus, I think it's possible to see Idaho as Van Zandt's reply to Orson Welles' appropriation of the Falstaff tale. Unlike Falstaff, 
uh, which is really an embittered older man's lament. Uh, my own private Idaho has a considerable amount of youthful verve, and in this sense, it's much more reminiscent of Citizen Kane than it is of Falstaff. It has an exuberance that I think was clearly a primary quality evinced by Citizen Kane. Like Kane, with its um, spiraling time scheme and its incredibly inventive, mind-bending repertoire of illusionistic tricks, my own private Idaho places the film viewer um, in a condition of what can only be called cognitive dissonance. The murky consciousness of Mike, uh, tempered by the organizational cool of Scott. True to the road movie mythology, my own private Idaho is a transitional work in almost every possible way. It's about the personal transition of its characters, and it also reflects something of the anxiety of Van Zandt himself uh, in his attempt to secure a foothold in the Hollywood industry. Looking backwards and forwards at once, Idaho is a film that um, uh, has a kind of longing for what Van Zandt had done previously, um, for his um, place in the spectrum of independent production, and even his sporadic engagement with what can only be called avant-garde projects, uh, kind of very short quasi-autobiographical films, uh, of which he made nearly a dozen over the course of his early career. In this regard, the title of one of his short films, Five Ways to Kill Yourself, is an almost perfect antithesis to what became his 1995 commercial breakthrough, To Die For. Van Zandt's early apprenticeship was served in um, uh, making uh, TV commercials. And he also uh, participated in a number of music videos for David Bowie, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Tracy Chapman, Elton John. Thus, he's someone who had a tendency from the get-go to think in short structures, to think in bursts of imagery, as well as in the kind of uh, uh, longer structures of the road movie uh, uh, journey motif. Fortunately for us as viewers, Van Zandt's ambivalence over making Hollywood uh, his potential um, fixed high-rent home is not completely dissolved through the making of My Own Private Idaho. Rather, that ambivalence has merged as a sort of persistent trope or motif, since like other directors, such as David Lynch or Steven Soderbergh, um, albeit with much, much wider swings of the pendulum, Van Zandt has continued to shuttle back and forth between the experimental worlds of independent production and much more uh, big, more big budget um, uh, commercial productions. Thus his most recent films, um, Jerry and Elephant, continue to carry forward something of the youthful resistance uh, that we see played out in allegorical form in my own private Idaho. And there's every indication that Van Zandt will continue to enact this little dance of rebellion and submission, at least within uh, the uh, confines of his movie-making career. Scotty, Scotty. What's that, Jane? There's a functionary from your father who wants to have a few words with you. Give him enough to make him a reactionary and send him back to my mother. What kind of man is he? An old man. Shall I get rid of him? Please do, Bob. With faith, I'll send him packing.
Now, guys, like a lady, you fought fair. So did you, Gary, and you, Digger. You are strong, too. But your instinct told you to run away. You won't touch the true air. No way. You made us swear to tell you it was lost in a fight, and then made us do the like. Yeah. Tell me, Scotty, are you not horribly afraid? You being the heir apparent? Couldn't the world pick out enemies as fierce as Ken Death or that other scoundrel, Hal Wheeler, and hold you ransom? Aren't you afraid? Not a bit. But maybe I lack some of your instinct. Well, you will be horribly scolded tomorrow when you go to your father, if you love me. Practice your answers to him. Gather, lads, boys, be merry. Shall we have a play? Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right, then. Give me a drink. <coughs> to make my eyes look red, because I have to speak with passion. <laughs> And you'll have thought I wept. Look out, nobility. Mike, Mike, wake up on show. Scotty, I do not only marvel at how you spend your time, but also how you are accompanied. <laughs> He looks like one of those street theater people, if ever I've seen one. If you are truly my blood relative, I have partly your mother's word that she'd give birth to you, partly my own opinion, but chiefly a villainous trait of your eye, like mine, and a foolish hanging of your lower lip, which comes from your mother, that proves you are my real son. But a peculiar motion of your wrist. I don't know where that comes from. If you are my real son then, here lies the point. Why are you so pointed out? Shall my son prove to be a truant and eat blackberries? A question not to be asked. Shall the son of Portland be a thief? and rob money from its citizens? A question to be asked. Scotty, eh? I do not speak to you in drink, but in tears, not in pleasure, but in passion, not in words, but in woes also. And yet, there is a virtuous man whom I have often noted in your company, but I don't know his name. What kind of man, father? A portly man, I think, with a cheerful, corpulent look in his eye, a very suave walk, and I think he must be 50 or so. Keep with this man and banish the rest. Can we get him upstairs? No way, Jose. You don't speak like a mayor. <laughs> You stand for me, and I'll play my father. You would depose me? Here I am. I'm here. I stand to be judged, to judge my father. Now, Scott, where have you come from? From Old Town, Father. Mm. <coughs> oh. oh, the complaints I hear about are embarrassing. But they are false. I amuse you as a son, I hope. Is a devil that haunts you in the likeness of an old fat man. <laughs> a tum of man. Who is your companion? Why do you converse with that trunk of humors? 
That bolting hutch of beastliness. <laughs> that swollen parcel of dropsies. That huge bombard of sap. <laughs> that stuck cloak bag of guts. That, that roasted matting tree. Ah, <laughs> the pudding stuffed inside his belly. That reverend of vice. The gray iniquity, that father ruffian, that vanity in years. Where is he good but to taste wine and to drink it? Only crafty in his villainy and worthy of nothing! Who do you mean? Father and mayor? That villainous, abominable mess leader of youth! Bob! You, Bob! That old white bearded Satan! If, if sack and sugar be a fault, God help the wicked. If to be old and marry is a sin, then many an old host that I know is damned. If to be fat is to be hated, then Pharaoh's being kind are to be loved. No, my father. Banish the others. Digger, Gary, Mike, banish them, but not sweet Bob Pigeon. Kind and true Bob Pigeon. If you banish plump Bob, you will banish all the world. I will. Yeah. That'll be all three right. bucks. All right, thank, thank you. Gary. What's up? Hey, Michael, how, how you, you doing? doing? Pretty good, yeah. I heard something about this, I wasn't quite sure, and I figured I'd stop by. Yeah, well, you know it's different. That's you know, cool. Streets. You want a hot dog, man? Sure, I'll take some dead pig, yeah. Well, they're normally a uh, buck, but uh, for you, 50 cents, huh? Thanks, man. How you doing, man? Excuse me. Can I get you something? Uh... No, that's my first day on the job. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. You and Gary both. That's weird. You both are working. Um, I'll, I'll, like a cranberry juice town is good. It's good for you, right? It's good for you. It smells too bad. It smells? Yeah.
Excuse me. Are you all right? Are you okay? If you want to leave us, it's okay, but we need you to sign out, and you're going to have to go downstairs and get your clothes. You can sign right here. I wouldn't mind living here. Do you live here? <laughs> Why, no. But sometimes I do feel like I live here. Here, you just sign right there. myself and tell the story. Yeah. That's what I'll do. Okay. You guys ready? Yeah. Hello, I'm Trey Shannon from Portland, Oregon, and I'm a co-owner of Voodoo Donut. And uh, I have kind of an interesting story to tell about uh, the night of the premiere of uh, my own private Idaho, which was uh, held at the Clinton Street Theater. And I don't remember the date exactly, but it was uh, during the summer, I believe. And uh, Scott Green was a friend of mine. The Kurtz Project played the rap party as well at some point with the Tutu Band. And uh, Scott Green and I were buddies, and I've known Gus kind of on and off, you know, casually for a while and liked his band Destroy All Blondes back in the late 80s. And uh, he uh, got, it was a big to do. All of Portland was invited. It was Gus Van Stan's new big movie he'd been working on. But he showed an earlier screening at like 6 o'clock for uh, the cast and crew, and I got invited to that. And so after the movie, Scott Green uh, invited, we had this, he had been promising for about two years to give me a radio transmitter. And uh, I kept thinking a radio transmitter was this huge thing I would need a truck for or something. But he assured me uh, after the screening that we could go get it right then and there because we had just seen the movie and we needed to kind of blow out of there. So we uh, drove to Gus's house where Scott had been staying, and I guess a lot of the you know principals in the movie had been staying at Gus's pad there, and he had just bought this house up in the hills, and uh, so we ended up going to Gus Van Zant's house, which uh, was kind of interesting because every single person in Portland was at the Clinton Street Theater, including Gus Van Zant, and no one was watching his house. So now that Gus is a big wig, if he ever does these screenings again in Portland, he should always put somebody on the you know on the door there to guard his house because uh, Scott Green led us into his house, and of course I was very respectful, I liked Mr. Van Zant and all, and I wouldn't have touched anything at all, but while we were looking at the radio transmitter, which happened to only like fit in a shoebox or something, thank you, in a little shoebox deal, um, <laughs> my uh, partner Benjamin from the X-Ray, uh, he and Scott were discussing the radio transmitter, which then allowed me to sort of walk around and bothered and, and uh, just kind of wander around Gus's new beautiful house, which was kind of sparsely furniture, but he was working and uh, lots of proofs of uh, William Burroughs on the kitchen table and lots of actual, you know, photos of William Burroughs and he'd been working, I think, with William and Kurt Cobain and all of those and I, you know, I don't know what Gus was doing at those times, but all sorts of stuff and, uh, and so while I'm sitting there looking at all these pictures of William Burroughs, which are pretty fascinating, I noticed that his address book was sitting there, and uh, I feel really bad about this, Gus, but uh, I kind of like, and I really did do this, I didn't even thumb through it, I actually took a pencil and I flipped open just a one page, and uh, on that one page that I flipped to was John Waters, the other acclaimed filmmaker from Baltimore, Maryland, uh, address and phone number and things, so I wrote down John Waters' information, and then I used to call John Waters uh, late at night back in the mid-90s, kind of, I'd get kind of drunk or whatever and call John Waters up and brag to people at parties that I knew John Waters and then I'd call him and only one time did John Waters answer and I kind of woke him up because I always forget about the time zone problem. But there's that story about, uh, about that and I just thought it was just so kind of fascinating to sort of walk around Gus's stuff and sort of, uh, you know, he had his guitars, he had a lot of guitars, and I, it was kind of, he always did music and stuff. I'm still trying to get Gus to put the Story All Blondes back together. It would be a huge, huge, huge show. So if you ever want to put that show together, Gus, you just call me up. I'll make that happen. So there's that story. And then also just, you know, people around Portland, you know, running into River Phoenix and Keanu Reeves and yada, 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 everybody going to parties and having stories. But I didn't really get to hang out with them too much. A little bit at the Mallory Hotel at the Driftwood Room. And then I know a lot of people up there at the Driftwood Room where people uh, would say that, like, River and his sisters and things were, were, like, hanging out and were very nice and, like, playing the guitar in the lobby after hours and stuff like that, which all seemed kind of cool. And, that, you know, Portland showed him a good welcome for sure, so. There you go. That's cool. That's cool. Do you want me to tell you another quick one? I can tell you about Bob. Yeah, tell us yeah, about Bob. I'll tell you one quick story about Bob. Um, so, 
Bob was uh, in the movie, and uh, he pretty much played himself, and he was brilliant in it. And uh, Bob was kind of a character around town, and I, I kind of came across him sort of later on, again, right around that town time, and I think was introduced by probably through Scott Green. And uh, he was pretty much a, like, he kind of knew everybody in Portland, and I don't really know exactly what his whole story was, but he was a, he was kind of like Jabba the Hutt, and he was really gay. And, uh, and that which was you know pretty interesting going over there because there was always these kind of characters kind of in and out of his bedroom and his living room and you weren't really sure what was going on and he would sort of sit in a robe with nothing on underneath and it would you know it's you know his robe would part and you would see his you know job of the head penis and things and and he, yeah, he talks you slowly right and he had that crazy bob voice I'm slobbering and and uh, he had a real, he had kind of a liking to my uh, business partner, Benjamin, and made him very uncomfortable. And one time we were over at Bob's house and um, doing illicit substances, and uh, cops happened to be in town at the same time, that terrible, terrible show, cops. And uh, we were all kind of sitting in Bob's bedroom, and uh, suddenly, like, out, it, he lived on misery and failing, Missouri and failing. He always liked saying, like, I live on a corner of misery and failing, which is always pretty amusing. And, uh, and suddenly, like, his entire backyard, like, opens this, like, boom, boom, it's all lit up. And we're like, Jesus Christ, we're getting busted. Everybody's scrambling around, freaking out. But it was just cops was in town, and they had, like, busted this poor soul and had chased him into Bob's backyard. And so there was all these TV cameras and cops, and they're busting this guy. And it was terrible. I hate that show. Never, ever watch cops. That was that story, too. Um, my name's Trace Shannon, and this is Voodoo Donut. And I'm a, a co-owner of Voodoo Donut, and uh, it's downtown, in, uh, still in Old Town, so Gus understands Old Town. You should come down and get a donut sometime. You. You're welcome. Magic moment. It was like a, you know, I think we all knew we were doing something, you know, even though we didn't discuss it, I, I'm sure, I think we all knew that we were doing something quite unique at the time. It's a film of a particular moment, a film of a particular uh, zeitgeist, and it isn't something that can be duplicated. The whole experience of editing My Own Private Idaho it was the greatest experience I've had creatively as a filmmaker. Malinochi was sort of the first thing he did that uh, got him some, you know, industry notice. He wanted to do My Own Private Idaho right after he did Malinochi. And um, I think when he started to have the chance to talk to agents and to talk to, to people in Hollywood, you know, have an audience with people that could fund movies in Hollywood, um, that was the first thing he pitched. And I think they said, what else do you have? And he also had this thing uh, that was sort of in his back pocket called Drugstore Cowboy. And Drugstore Cowboy was, you know, they said, no, you know, forget the gay hustler thing. Let's, you know, how about the Drugstore Cowboy? So, and that got produced first. Drugstore Cowboy was, uh, was hugely important for me as, as a designer. I don't know that I was 100% confident at the beginning of Drugstore Cowboy that he could pull off the oddball juxtapositions there, that he could make a movie about junkies and get away with it in Hollywood when you're not allowed to do that. But he proved to me and everybody else that he could. When Drugstore Cowboy had the success it did, I think he had more choices and he was able to do, he was able to do you know, this gave him a chance to do My Own Private Idaho, which he was, he was aching to do. So um, he was able to sort of come home to Portland, come home to where he was, and make this regional film, and, um, you know, be left alone to some extent and hire the people that he wanted to work with. He was very eager to go back to Portland and work the way he had on Malinoche. And uh, his idea was that he was going to make this film for under half a million dollars, 
uh, with local kids in Portland. So he was very excited and talked about it. And at the same time, he was sort of fantasizing about his dream cast and, well, who knows what's going to happen with this film Drugstore Cowboy and probably nobody's going to be interested, but at least it'll give me a chance to do my own private Idaho. But wow, wouldn't it be great if we could get somebody like River Phoenix? There was never any doubt in my mind that what the script was trying to do was a profoundly wise thing. I still feel like it's, it, the, that that script is one of the dozen best scripts I've ever read in my life. The script was defiantly off the charts. The script was going into territory that scripts don't go. They didn't go in those years. And I mean, this really, at this point, you really have to scratch to think of other films that anybody saw that really had a gay theme and weren't sort of pandering. So everybody knew that we were out on a limb, we were exposed. There was the sort of comfort of having Gus's success with Drugstore Cowboy behind us. Everybody kind of already got it that Gus was smarter than everybody else and he could do things that other people couldn't do and get away with it and really sort of thrill the audience. With My Own Private Idaho, we were pushing it much further, much further thematically, much further in terms of sexuality. Um, and we were equipped with the sort of strength of Gus's success the first time around, but we also knew we were exposed because this wasn't the script that you necessarily would invite your sort of Aunt Martha to read. Fast, little Dutch boy, harder. That sound, that sound. Oh, that I didn't realize how good Gus was. I didn't realize how good the script was, you know, and how, and how uh, right on it was about Mikey being this character who's kind of young and n not, not at all grown up. It's, it's, it's really the juxtaposition of childhood and being forced into doing, you know, adult things like, um, you know, like, like, you know, turning tricks for a living, you know. And uh, I, th I think, al although Gus didn't sensationalize on that, I think what he did was he really captured it in an intimate, in a personal way. He had started working on this story even before Drugstore Cowboy, and it was something that had been in his life for a long time. And the street world of Portland was really important to him. I mean, he was, he was interested in it because of the stories that dwelled there. He was interested in it because of his sort of personal relationship to it. And he was interested in it because of the way it connected to the whole history of storytelling and this sort of whacked out idea of tying the streets of, of Portland together with Shakespeare, um, I think it gestated for a long time. By the time I first read the script, I, 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 was, I was thunderstruck. I just couldn't believe that so much intelligence was allowed to be in Hollywood cinema. Jesus, the things we've seen. Aren't I right, Bob? Aren't I right? We have heard the chimes at midnight. That we have. That we have. Gus was inspired by Chimes at Midnight, uh, definitely. And that was always part of the conception. You know, he, he always acknowledged that one of the central ideas of the film was the parallel between the world of Henry IV uh, and, and the Portland street world. And the idea being that this sort of story is timeless. You know, that there have always been these street kids and these magnetic figures who organize them and create an alternate life and they're in conflict with the respectable world. Without verbalizing it, without sort of wallowing in, in what it means, I could always feel that Gus was very in touch with each end of these poles. Um, the street life and the Shakespeare life and the way there was a street life in Shakespeare and the way there was a nobility in the streets of Portland that was always sort of seething under the surface of Gus. Um, so he didn't have to say anything, but, but I could feel it. And everything he put out referred to that. The point of this movie was not to make that world 
look sleazy or to find the sleaziness in that world. The point of this movie was to find the amusement of that world, to find what you do with your mind and your buddies when you live there. What do you think about? What do you laugh about? How do you get through the day? Hey, you dick! Scotty, my friend. Oh, you li hey, you like that, huh? You like that. My new Nikes. My new bracelet. It says Rudy, though. That's cool. My new Calvins. What a dickhead. <laughs> so stupid. Gus is not the kind of person who is telling jokes, but he is the kind of person who carries a wry smile with him everywhere he goes because he finds amusement in the way people live together. It's a sad story. It's a, it's a tragic story. Even in the, some of the tougher scenes, Gus always offers a little bit of comic relief. Dear honey, found a job in the lounge, the family tree in Snake River. If you're ever out this way, look me up, little phone. Rooms, phones, color TV, wall to wall carpeting, individually controlled electric heat combination tub, and showers, game table, and two reading chairs with some connecting rooms. It sounds so nice. It's pretty legendary the fact that uh, this film didn't follow the script at all. Uh, or at least only in a very sketchy way. You know, the actors really use the script as a jumping off point, and it's to Gus's credit that he was comfortable enough to let them do it because they did a lot of brilliant stuff that uh, they were sort of inspired to do by the script. The cruel part of filmmaking for actors is that they show up at six in the morning and then you're rehearsing for maybe an hour and then they go away and everybody lights and gets the camera set up and you know after you've discussed the coverage and you know everything kind of comes from from this process of the actors um, you know not having enough time to rehearse it's not like a play where you you can go and and you can you can really scrutinize everything and analyze everything and tear it apart and you really have to just go 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 you know it came down to to Gus's vision and Gus being able to work alone and Gus being able to delay a lot of his decisions until the moment that we're on the set and figuring it out. You know, like how do you block a scene? How do you cover a scene? And Gus tends to work very directly. You know, his, his, his work was very, very simple. You'd start with the beginning of a scene and shoot that and then you'd kind of go, okay, we'll, we'll get a new camera angle over here. Uh, for the middle of the scene, and then we'll kind of grab a new angle for this over here at the at the end of the scene. Visually, it kept it alive, and it sort of was a very direct way to deal with with blocking and coverage, and and still you know still giving yourself as many choices in the editing room as you need. <laughs> oh, oh, my sweetheart, come and rob with us tomorrow. Oh, I was going to anyway. I was just kidding. There was a tendency for us to want to, uh, you know, to, to minimize coverage. So um, uh, whenever we could, we could pull it off in, in one or two shots without coverage, uh, that was always a great thing because, we, you know, we didn't have all the money in the world. We needed to be able to move fast. I mean, the thing about this film is that it was all about freedom. It was just still Gus and all of us here in Portland making... Um, what I've now grown to call college filmmaking. You know, it was all of us making a college film. It was truly an independent film in the independent film sense that we were left alone. It was this atmosphere where anything that you could think of that would make a better film was welcome. There was no money, so it's not like it was carte blanche. But the discussion about how do you make the film right, how do you best tell the story, how are you most expressive with the sets or with the costumes or with the colors, um, that was all welcome conversation. Gus had been trusted at this point to do something worthwhile, and people were sort of allowing him to do uh, what he wanted to do. I don't think I'll ever experience that kind of freedom again in, in, in filmmaking, you know, to where you're really just having communication with the director, and you're just purely, uh, you know, thrown into this world that's completely, um, it's completely of, of our own invention, of Gus's own invention. And, um, and you know, that, that feeling, I, I've never, probably never felt that 
that singular feeling so strongly in any other film I've ever done. It was just the extraordinary circumstance of him emerging after the success of Drugstore Cowboy and remaining true to his desire to work in Portland, to work on his own terms, to sort of form his own little core of activity there, you know, rather than trying to build his career up in Hollywood terms and playing it their way. You know, he used the opportunity of his success with Drugstore Cowboy to go and do something that he really wanted to do. I have no question that spending time with Gus lured me into a Gus vision of the world. He was not explicit. He didn't verbalize the things that he liked, but he would point to them. And he would point here, and you'd see this fucked up face in the landscape. And he would point there, and you would see this relationship of this sort of raggedy, young, cute street kid next to a yellow building. Um, and when he pointed and pointed and pointed, it began to sort of sink in, this is how Gus Lenz's work. And yes, you see it everywhere after that. Um, and I, you know, I don't think I could drive down a road in, in um, Eastern Oregon and not see a fucked up face now. You know? And I, I don't think anyone who really even just watches the movie, let alone goes scouting it with Gus, could drive down those roads and not see those two bushes on the landscape and think, oh my God, that's what he was talking about. There's not another road anywhere that looks like this road. I mean, exactly like this road. It's one kind of place, one of a kind. Like someone's face. Like a fucked up face. What I began to realize is that in his, the, the, the value of his lateral thinking is something like that of a beachcomber. He knows where to look. He doesn't go with an agenda ahead of time. He opens his eyes, he sees the planet, and he spots. He knows how to tie disparate pieces together to create meaning. When I created Shooting Spaces for Gus, I understood that I wasn't guiding him into what was going to be the visual definition of that scene. I was trying to lay out a beachfront for him to pick what he wanted. Um, I was looking for possibilities, but I wasn't looking for the conclusion of how he was going to express his story visually in any given moment. We didn't work in the, in the best conditions. If you look at the film, uh, we worked in derelict hotels. We worked in the, in the rough side of town. This was, um, this was the, uh, the texture that we were looking for. It was finding locations that were rough, that were broken down, that were very likely places where street kids might live. The lighting and everything, you know, texturally and, and in terms of tone was, was really to bring out um, all of the textures of, of the dereliction of, of, of that, that segment of the city that we were dwelling in. You know, it was really the underbelly. You know, the world in the 80s uh, in Portland uh, included this Third Avenue street kid scene. These boys were always down there. Uh, they were down there, they were available, they were... The Mercedes were pulling up and the boys were jumping in the cars. All that old texture of Portland is gone. But the inspiration came from reality. This chick's living in a new car hat. It had to be made in Portland. This film had to be made in Portland. Drugstore Cowboy had to be made in Portland, and I actually didn't get that out of the starting gate. Portland is Gus's window on the world. He, he sees the world through the lens of Portland. As we scouted locations, I began to see that there were things that Gus desperately, desperately wanted in, in this hotel. And, and really, this was a, it was a very sort of central space. It was the world within the world that reflected everything else. And somewhere along the way, I realized that there was no one location that would do it all nor did we have the money to build the right things into any single location. And knowing that it would have a production penalty for, for moving the company and, and breaking up the continuity of the scenes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, 
Um, I was hesitant to push the idea of splitting it into maybe more than one place or maybe more than two places. But Gus actually didn't have any problem with that at all. The sort of AD whined and groaned a bit, but in the end of the day, we were able to take the things that meant the most to Gus scenically and patch them all together. The hotel where the kids hung out, that was sort of a conglomeration of, of four, four different places. And each place that we went seemed to have um, you know, walls where the plaster and lath had been torn off and there were still just studs there. And, and um, there were wonderful staircases. The staircases tended to tie the whole thing together. Whenever you see a staircase and the kids are either scattering from the law or Keanu or, or Rivers walking up one of those staircases, that was the thing that kind of tied the locations together. There's a scene where Keanu is, uh, or rather uh, Scott, is uh, uh, leaving the downstairs of the governor, heading upstairs where Bob is asleep, and River's already robbing him. That is, uh, Mike Waters is already robbing uh, Bob Pigeon. And Scott has a beer bottle. Uh, he tosses a beer bottle to one street kid who's standing in the doorway, puts a cigarette in the other kid's mouth, and heads up the stairs. Uh, that was an idea of Gus's that was very, it's very much a Gus shot. It's, it's, it's very quick and snappy and clever and, 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 move, and says a lot about the character and, and moves uh, Scott right up the stairs in a really beautiful and kind of dashing way. Now, when you make a movie, and it's true with any film, you're dealing with convention and what conventions you establish at the outset. You know, like in the first 10 minutes of the film, this is when you usually do it. You, you, you jump in and you go, okay, now we're going to have a flashback. Like we had flashbacks to River and his childhood with his mother in the country. And um, that was always in the script. But the atmosphere, and again, it's in the first 10 minutes of the film, is like the time lapse, uh, the flashbacks, the, um, you know, all the things that, that uh, the, the mood of the film is, is pretty cleanly established right up front. There are also a number of cutaways we did that were extreme close-ups, and this is something that I think Gus perfected on Drugstore Cowboy, and he carried that invention into uh, my own private Idaho. There was like these really extreme close-ups of like the the fireworks being lit, or the um, or there'd just be a close-up of River's hand when he was going into a narcoleptic fit, and his hand would start shaking, and you know we'd just go from like these extreme wide shots to extreme close-ups. If you watch that film closely, uh, it, it's not slick. It's, uh, it's got very rough edges, and uh, we, we intended for the film to have that quality. Um, we, we, we really wanted, wanted it to, to not feel perfect. Um, this was a conceit. The conceit was that we would, we would, we would keep, it, keep it rough, and it, it, was, it was right for the subject matter. I think something that, that really illustrates the, um, so I guess the, the kind of the two styles, the, the, the perfection and the imperfection uh, are the opening scene and the, the, the closing scene of the film. Uh, in the opening scene, um, we start with a road and um, Mike Waters walks into frame. Uh, that's all handheld. The scene is repeated at the end of the film, only if you look at that scene, we're on a dolly track. It has a completely different approach, a much more formal approach. I've been tasting roads my whole life. This road will never end. So those two, those two uh, scenes bookend the film. He starts at the road and he ends back at the same road. Uh, only the approach to shooting those two scenes is completely different. Unlike his other films up to that point, this was a film where he moved the camera more. There was more dolling, there was more um, shifting of points of view. We went onto the top of uh, the highest building in Portland to shoot this, just a shot of, I guess it was the two of them, on the motorcycle riding through Old Town. And it was a wonderful eagle's eye view of the streets. And then he also wanted a shot uh, from the brake pedal of the motorcycle looking up at the handlebars.
being able to sort of maintain an unbroken mood and main, maintain a visual continuity, you know, that really kind of tested me. But it also, it was also just a, a moment of pure experimentation. It was like a, it was like a, it was the first time I really started skipping light off of the floors uh, up into actors' faces. It was the first time I'd used uh, contrast so heavily, black as much, you know, it's sort of like, you know, what do you withhold from the frame and what you show? So it's, it's, it's more powerful poetically to, to withhold information. And when we were sort of in these moments where drama seemed a little more epic, you'd, you'd put a little more contrast or edge or, you know. It was the first time I was able to feel really in command of, you know, all the, all the tricks that I'd sort of known up to that point. There were times when we did shots that were, that were very, very considered, like the crane move into the uh, porn shop. It's a very, very considered move and pulls you into this world, this really dark world that when you enter it, um, you enter slow motion and it's surreal. There's blinking lights, there's, 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 scary, there's scary guys. Uh, you're in slow motion. Uh, you're kind of entering a, a, a bit of hell. Um, but at the same time, um, once again, Gus offers comic relief by having the, the gay porn magazines come to life. I still have to say that's probably been one of the most entertaining design jobs of my career was, was making those magazine covers. This was in the sort of Stone Age when CGI was not available in, in any way to low-rent movies. And I'm pretty sure that it was Gus's idea that there had to be a, a sort of low dollar solution to it. And I'm fairly certain that it was his idea what the solution would look like, which, which um, ended up being big sheets of plexiglass on which we um, stuck vinyl lettering and vinyl appliques to imply the fronts of the magazines. Background behind it sandwiched the actor in between the plexiglass and the background. And there you have a living magazine cover. We marked up each individual magazine uh, at a time, and around the front of it was sort of a, a kind of vinyl, I think it was like a vinyl wood grain pattern that resembled the wide shot of those actual uh, shelves that were in the pornography store. And um, I just bounced light off of the inside, and the actors were really just really close to the glass like this. It's when you start doing things for free that you start to grow wings. Isn't that right, Mike? What? Wings, Michael. You grow wings and become a fairy. What do you care about money? Shit, you got plenty of money. Why don't you just go ahead and do whatever it is that you do? You can only imagine what that is for free. Is that right, sweetie? I don't think anybody would do anything this low rent anymore, even on very, very cheap movies. But I, I don't know, I think it's, it's still, it still holds up. Eric had been experimenting with his time lapse and uh, coming up with really, really beautiful things. Eric always had a camera set up. He always had a camera doing time lapse of clouds and mountains. To me, as I look at the film, the time lapse is really this atmospheric thing, and uh, and it's and it's you know it's done so early in the movie that that Gus sets the tone and he sets the he sets the convention for for breaking form. Uh, very nicely. It was an atmospheric thing that seemed to sort of go well, you know, in creating this sort of mystique about about Portland, about the Northwest. You know, and in the end it was just, it was gravy, you know, it was just, these were gravy shots. There was a documentary aspect to this film, uh, which required me with a camera on my shoulder to, to be able to, to, you know, to follow, to follow River or to follow, to follow Keanu when they were moving around and improvising. There were times when I did shots where, where, where the light was so low and the focus was so critical that I literally had to touch River. I had to hold on to him and hold the camera on my shoulder in order to keep the, keep the shot in focus. I mean, I don't know how often um, you, you get to, 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 <laughs> to, to grab onto the actor and to, and to do a kind of dance. River was a wildly ferocious and passionate gentle and lovely soul and and to work in really close with him was a real honor there were times when 
when um, it, it, it seemed right to, to work with just available light, me, the camera, and Gus, and the actor. Uh, a good example of this is Grace Zabriskie uh, is in the bedroom with, with, uh, with, with Mike. It was just Gus and River and Grace and I, and uh, we just used, used the, uh, the practical lights for that scene. And I just grabbed the focus myself. There was no focus puller. Um, so we were really kind of wandering around with the camera. You feel the, the intimacy uh, because there's, there's really no one around but, but Gus and I and, and River and then eventually Grace. When River started doing his thing, it just transformed a lot of the work. Uh, everyone could see that he was just turning in such a tremendous performance and he was so deeply into his character that I think the shooting every day and certainly the cutting uh, responded to what he was giving us. River really came in and and took control as far as the you know the the impact of his character and and what that meant to the film as a whole. I would even say that the film as originally envisioned uh, wouldn't wouldn't be described as the story of that character Mike. That it was he was one character, a prominent character among this whole panorama of street kids and, you know, a view of life on the streets in Portland. But River really made it his own and it was so overwhelming that I think the film went in the direction that it ultimately did for for the better. River's presence was um was very important in, in the making of the movie because he was so engaged with, with the effort. I mean, he cared about the story, he cared about the group of us making the story, and he cared about getting it right. He, it was, he was quite obsessive about getting this movie right. And early on, when, the, when a new draft of the script came out and it was time for him to sort of get on top of his lines, all he wanted to do was read his character out loud back and forth with somebody else. And he wanted to go through it again and again until it sort of sunk into his DNA. He felt that movie in every possible way. And I've rarely experienced such a level of engagement with the broadest sense of the filmmaking as, as I did with River. I think River went to a place where he'd never gone before as an actor. And he was playing in a role. I think these roles were very risky for uh, Keanu and for River in that they were gay hustlers. And it was a very, um, you know, the, the material was, was very risky. It was, it was material that really ha hadn't been covered, you know. I mean, that's one of the things that was magical about this film is that we were doing something that it, we felt we'd never done before. I think we all knew that, you know, we all, we all sensed that, although you never know what the outcome of a movie is. But when I see River in the scene where he's in the lobby and, and uh, Bob is recounting his tale of the robbery, you know, there's moments where I just see River off camera, I mean in a cutaway, uh, where he's just laughing or moving or reacting in a way that's so uh, purely uh, original. I've never seen anything like it. You know, it's, it's, to me, it was sort of like watching James Dean. There was this thing that, that I, had, I hadn't seen in, in actors in a long time, and it was like, it was like, a, it was like a, a, a place where, you know, it was almost like everything River was doing was, was, when the camera was rolling, was like almost an unexplored place. What new trick do you have for us now, Bob? <laughs> You know, River had to do this film uh, for almost no money, and his representatives were against him doing it. Uh, he had to be approached secretly, and uh, he could very easily have not done the film, you know, just given the state of Hollywood mentality, even as, as it existed then. No one would ever realize just how great an actor he was and how much he had to say if it weren't for this film. 
River did a fair number of films, and he's very good in several of them, but I don't think there's anything he ever did that comes close to this. I understand. Do you? Yes. You know how you feel. I think I fall in love. When we made the initial cut of the campfire scene, um, everyone was aware that it was it was, you know, special material. And uh, just even watching the dailies, everyone was pretty mesmerized by what River was doing. I don't know. I don't feel like I can be. I don't feel like I can be close to you. It was a very important scene for Gus. Um, I mean, it's a pivotal scene in the script, but it was very important to Gus that he get it right. I think that he saw that as the kind of apex of the, the Mike and Scott relationship, and that is where he felt like he had to push those two actors to the absolute limit, and he wanted a controlled space for it. So we contrived this scheme where we would uh, paint a backing and plant in it a little bit of background twinkly light and build a desert landscape in front of it and have a bit of a horizon line across the uh, bottom. Um, we, we put it all together in a stinky old warehouse and we could have more than, you know, more than a normal shooting day to do the scene. The campfire scene was really, was really tricky because um, number one, Gus wanted the set to be clear of all people. He really wanted to do this alone with just the camera and the actors. And so, I, lighting-wise, I had to set up something that, that, that was sort of universal. The cyclorama on the stage, it was one of those sort of coved things. And uh, I just gave a glow to the sky. And, um, and then for the, for the boys in front of the fire, there was just a little tiny bit of sort of uh, just suggested moonlight backlight on their hair, and then uh, the key was the key lighting was the, was was an actual flame that we put in the, the special effects uh, person put in the uh, in the fake fire logs in front of them. So I asked him to turn it up, and I just I really just had my light meter out there, and it was like you know we just adjusted that flame until we had enough, and that was it, you know. Do the scene. All right, to me, Mike. It's a sight. Gus and I talked about the difficulty of of shooting shooting sex in American cinema. How it's it's been so overdone, and and it's so easy to do to or it's so easy to do badly that uh, we needed an idea, we needed something that would be really, really different. Mike? What? I'm extremely excited. The sex scenes were uh, their own thing, and those, those were written, I mean, they're in the script, that they were going to be a series of stills that were just, um, that were motionless, although they were shot real time. And uh, to me, that was that was like one of Gus's um, brilliant, you know, inventions in the writing stage was was to come up with those. The sex scenes were tricky because um, I think um, River and Keanu were very very nervous about doing those. Gus, even to his credit, he carried it over into the Italian moment with uh, with uh, Carmela, where Keanu and Carmela are having a love scene and uh, a hetero love scene. And he, he gives it exactly the same treatment, which I think is brilliant. I always enjoyed working with Gus in the cutting room because uh, it, it was a very free relationship. Uh, I had a lot of creative room, which is wonderful for an editor. Uh, while he was shooting, he rarely came to the cutting room. So that was a particularly enjoyable time because I was able to play with the footage and explore it and find things of my own and Gus as he did with the actors would always be open to what I'd found and would appreciate things that I had found. Footage would come in and there'd be fantastic moments, fantastic uh, scenes captured you know in a single take but 
in terms of continuity and in terms of being able to assemble scenes, it wasn't always easy. One good example of that is the scene in the uh, Chinese restaurant where all the kids are gathered around and it's just little vignettes of them hanging out and uh, interacting with one another. No, it's not even a scene really. You know, you just observe their behavior when they're in some sort of neutral environment. And then uh, Gus turned the camera on some of the, the kids who were extras, who were actual street kids. And it suddenly turned into a documentary. And he had three or four of the kids just tell stories of their experiences on the streets. My first day was in Portland. I was, um, I was hanging out at the city club one night. I was finding really hard on acid and speed. There was this big black guy who had a lot of eight balls of speed, a lot of money. And they were these fantastic interviews, really, with these kids. Uh, so I felt like we've got to do something with this. But formally, it didn't fit in at all with what we were doing, right? So, it, it, but it didn't really matter. You know, that was the atmosphere on the film that we're going to go with whatever seems interesting and exciting that day. So I thought, yeah, why not? Why, you know, there's no reason we can't just sort of break form and go into this. Gus instilled for me, I think, a deeper respect for the director. That what you don't understand about a director actually could be very important and very fruitful territory. And you know, I, 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 I try to understand everything, but I, I, I learned from Gus that even if you cannot under, understand it, it, it may be beyond understanding and still very, very important to the work that you have to do. Um, there's something in there about respecting, respecting the unknown mental processes that I think has equipped me better for, for all of the films I've done since. The impressive thing about Gus on all the movies that I worked on with him was that he was happy to have everybody contribute their ideas and he welcomed it and he never tried to put himself up as uh, the only one who got to have any fun. Um, you know, that's not to say that he wasn't in charge, you know, he certainly was, but I think that he was a director in the true sense of that word, that he directed everyone in a certain way so that we understood where we were going. And yet everybody else then with that framework was able to bring their own ideas, their own inspirations. We were all, everyone was having fun. And I think that made it really exciting to come to work every day. We captured a moment, we captured a, 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 um, a vision of Gus's and, and it was something that was delicate, ephemeral. We got it on film and it's, it's there. It's there as a record. Because when you're making a film, you have no idea if anyone's gonna like it, um, if it's gonna cut together, if it's gonna make sense, if it's gonna be anything, or if it's just gonna be rubbish, you know? You don't know, you don't know if you're golden or if you're wearing clown shoes. You just don't know, and so, you know, after the editing and after, well, really now and in, in retrospect after all this time and what, what uh, Idaho has gone through critically and, you know, in terms of making money and, you know, and all that, it's like, uh, you know, now I can look back and, and be pretty proud of what a historic uh, thing it was to do and, and to be a part of. I think River came in character. He had this sort of being of a person who hadn't, you know, had a bed necessarily the night before and hadn't washed his clothes in a long time. But it wasn't, it wasn't the way he looked. I mean, it was that, but it wasn't just that. It was sort of, he had that, he had that internalized sadness and he had that kind of quiet, meditative quality that runaway boys have, you know, the sprightliness is a departure a little bit from the basic state of loneliness. 
I think for my brother to be able to translate that to people, you know, the feelings he had, the sadness he felt around meeting these people and knowing these lives existed that were abandoned, these children that were abandoned and didn't have family and didn't have a sense of self. And it was important to him, I think, to tell their story. Yeah. You know, because we had a really loving family and really caring um, mom, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I, f I think having met these kids who didn't, you know, it wasn't like an easy thing to no, just that's what jump was so into amazing that. About it. Yeah. Is that he really he understood because he learned from them what it was like to be abandoned. I think that was part of his mission was to translate that to the rest of the world. Like these, there are these children out here that exist and. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to be a voice for them in some respect. I mean, that's what I took from watching the film. You know, it wasn't like seeing my brother at all. Well, that was what was so weird for me, because I'd known him when he was even younger, you know, in um, that uh, the Night in the Life of Jimmy Reardon. Oh, right. And I remember, you know, when he was really skinny, 15, you know, and trying to doing push-ups in between takes and stuff. <laughs> and he had... He was so well mothered. That's the thing that came across about him all the time was mm -hmm. that he seemed shiny, like healthy. He was really healthy. Mm -hmm. And then when he showed up, he was like almost, I mean, it was weird. It was like he was channeling that character. I was thinking about it the first time that we picked up River at the airport. We picked up all the actors at the airport <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> And then I remember we, we came and got you, and you were like 17, right? Yeah. River was 20. For that to be one of my first real, like, on set, on location set experiences, and like behind the scenes in that sense, was really uh, educational and definitely got me ready for cowgirls in the sense that, you know, it was like a family that I really felt comfortable with, that I was... You know, and I trusted because my brother had trusted and it kind of happened that way. He was older than me, so it comes down the line like that. Like, as long as it's recommended by the older sibling, everything's okay. You know, mm -hmm. so I felt that way, very safe with you guys. Um, and just watching Gus work, you know, it really made me want to work with him. Um, seeing the way that he worked and how much he cared for the actors and what their expression of his screenplay was and how incredibly as you know for a lot of directors that also write the screenplay how they can kind of hold on to what they mm -hmm. they want to see and he really was he let go yeah, and let the really actors did. tell him what their version of his screenplay was mm -hmm. and that was beautiful to see that the sort of freedom yeah that it it's is to rare, work with that him. kind it of is. confidence yeah. in a director especially early in his career like that, that yeah he was totally confident yeah Gus is able to not um, not determine an actor's performance. He allows the actor to have their own performance, but he's really great at um, keeping them from falling. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like there's this net there. Mm -hmm. River really cared a great deal about Gus and his vision for My Own Private Idaho and for Cowgirls, that he was, you know, integral in suggesting me for the role of Jelly Bean to Gus. I remember it. he was the one who let Gus know that I, I should definitely be in that movie, that, you know, he saw me in that movie. Gus was a painter, right? Didn't he go to RISD? Yeah. Is that how he started? Yeah, he went to RISD and his um, paintings, which I really always loved his paintings. Yeah, they were like the Mike paintings, yeah. Rivers characters yeah. paintings of his imagination. Yeah, yeah. Those images are so beautiful. He just has such a painterly way of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even some of the coolest effects like the cover boys, the magazines. Oh, I love that too, yeah. Those were all done completely you know, Not on Photoshop, camera. right, yeah. actually cut and pasted. Yeah. No, physically. I remember standing outside of this restaurant and it had you know, a platform in front of a picture window, and it was pre-viewfinder, so Gus always used to go like right. this to right. everything. Remember, he used to walk around <laughs> like yes. that all yes. the time. Yes. And, um, <laughs> and so he's like, you know, standing across the street going, you know, like that. It can look good, just like that. And, um, <laughs> and everybody was saying, no, there's no way. It's not good. It's going to look fake you're not it's not gonna look flat it's not gonna look 2d 
And he just kept saying, it is, it is. And so, you know, we built this sort of Hollywood Squares thing for all the cover boys. And he was completely right with graphics over it. That was a great contribution of David Brisbane, those um, graphics. He made up all the, those titles like G-String Jesus and, you know, King the, the Lear, L-E-E-R. I loved that. I still love that about Gus's work. That simplicity. He never abandons all those film school tricks. He uses those to such incredible advantage. Mm. Almost like the skateboard dolly, the grocery cart kind of, you know, dolly. Those sorts of things are entirely, I don't know about now, but I mean, then they were mm -hmm. certainly part of, I mean, several mm -hmm. films along the way. I love to know that Idaho was, you know, old school. It was razor blade and tape, absolutely, yeah. all the way. It's beautiful. I love that. Remember that shot where Keanu's holding River under the statue? Yeah, yeah. And um, that's actually not a statue. That's Freddy. Remember oh, Freddy? That's right. That's Freddy made to look like an Indian, and he's covered with this greeny black Gloop. I mean, it's so convincing. It really looks like a statue. It yeah. doesn't look like a person at all. I remember that now. It was just the animal, and then they put him on it. That was the sort of thing. If you didn't have money to actually make a statue, then you took a PA and covered them with <laughs> slime and stuck them up on the walls. <laughs> I love that. But he looked perfect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We didn't have cell phones. We had bags of quarters, and we had, you know, to go to pay phones, and we didn't have drivers. We just, you know, had a big van and everybody. And I remember Bert. Keanu like, like pressed up against the van. Because <laughs> <laughs> there were so many people in the one van. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That definitely is what bred the family environment too. Is if mm -hmm. you don't, there is no real mother and father. It's like a, a group of yeah. kids, you know. Like right. you know, Teenagers, the yeah. parents are away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It seemed to bring everyone together closer, not, not feeling like there was any authority made it work. It was like a tightly run ship within its lack of authority. Yeah. Because everyone had their part, yeah. you know. When we went to Italy, the group was so small that it was kind of like what it would be like going with Mike and Scott to Italy. There was very little infrastructure around the locations and everything, and um, I think it, it allowed us to do things that you know, when we were on the lamb farm, there was lambing going on and um, slaughtering and just uh, this sort of very natural life that um, because we had so few people, it was able to just continue uninterrupted. And that was another amazing thing about it is that everywhere we went, people were sort of blasé about us. We, I think because we didn't really have the vibe of an important set. Yeah. Yeah at all. So, you know, we were really just kind of allowed to do whatever we wanted wherever we were. You guys weren't there very long. We weren't. We were Was only that there where you like shot the weeks. motorcycle scene where Mike and Scott pull up to frame on the motorcycle looking like gorgeous 50s icons? That like, was... Um, or is that in Portland? In Portland, that was. yeah. I love... I still that shot. I just mm -hmm. thinking about that a minute ago. How beautiful now, that I was where they the pull up to frame and they both just look so handsome and like... Yeah like James Dean and, and Marlon Brando or something, mm -hmm. you know, with glasses on, their hair, you know. Mm -hmm. Keanu loved that motorcycle. Yeah, I mean, was that an old Norton? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was beautiful. He wanted that motorcycle, he wanted to, and it was impossible to keep him off of it, even though mm -hmm. he wasn't allowed to be on it because of insurance purposes, but he, mm -hmm. he, insisted. he really insisted. <laughs> and uh, the fucked up face, excuse yeah. me, French. I see that in so mm -hmm. many things from mixing a record to half inch the, the thing uh -huh. looks like a fucked up face the yeah. real and I took a picture of it and it made me think of Idaho and the fucked mm -hmm. up face like, oh, yeah. I have that too where I, I my eye will just go yeah exactly it'll tunnel vision and see, oh there's mm -hmm. a face it's really I see those roads those roads of memory and imagination that don't have any place that were just the mm. narcoleptic seizure roads I see those a lot it's funny because we looked for roads I and mean, we just scouted roads and roads and roads, and we were, and so I got into the habit of always going, oh, that's a great road. Right. I have to have that road, like a character. 
With River, in the way of preparation was, um, we found this guy, Jake, who was a narcoleptic, who um, lived in Portland and um, really had that dreamy quality, sort of like he was half, half awake, half asleep all the time, and then he would say these incredibly prophetic, you know, poetic things, and then he, yeah. you know, <laughs> but it was very, um, really good, I think, preparation. And um, another thing I love about what Gus does of bringing the reality into the film, and but never really losing control of it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't ever become sort of documentary verite. It's always part of the story. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't really need to, he's not trying to explain who's who and who's real and who's not. And yeah. It's just, it just becomes part of it. Yeah. I mean, the whole kind of Falstaff story and um, Portland as Elizabethan England. And we, of course, cast real street people. And a lot of times on the street in Portland, the cops, they really couldn't tell, you know, who was real and who wasn't. I always remember the sounds of the shuffling feet in the building running back and forth, you know, mm -hmm. away from the cops and just the, you know, the visuals and the, the aural, like all the mm -hmm. things you take in from that scene and, and then Shakespeare. Like yeah. sort of like how that all the juxtaposition was such a, a, a strange artistic choice, but one mm -hmm. that translated really well, I thought. Yeah, that whole idea of, you know, chimes at midnight being sort of, the setup of Henry, Prince Hal, and you know it, him mixing with the commoners and then going back to his privilege was just perfect, you know. And then of course the Falstaff character being the one who could comprehend more than anyone. I mean, he was the real father of Keanu, you know, of that character in the story. Mm. The street father was more right. of a father than the the mayor. Right. Bill Richard. He was phenomenal. He yep. was uh, River's suggestion, right? I know. You guys because he him. was he was the director of Jimmy Reardon. Right. And he was a substitute because um, the original Bob didn't work out and so we were sort of desperate at the last minute and it was River's idea. He was phenomenal. He right? was really like the real Bob. Yeah. In in a lot of ways. Yeah. I was great for the Shakespeare's. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, he's very like orator's voice kind of. Yeah. Yeah. And Keanu too. That was really. I really loved that whole section. The River brought Keanu into That's the project. Right. Yeah, right? he did. Cause I think mm -hmm. they had done that movie. Um, I, I love, love you to, to death. death. That's exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was right after that, and I remember mm -hmm. he had gotten Keanu to come and meet Gus, and uh, he really wanted Keanu to do this with him because he just felt he was the person mm -hmm. to play Scott. And, and mm -hmm. the scene that I find the most sort of riveting in the movie is the campfire scene. Mm -hmm. River uh, pretty much wrote that, like rewrote the dialogue yeah. on that. And what I think he was ultimately going for in that scene was that it doesn't matter if you're gay or straight, like the story of unrequited love and of love mm -hmm. between a human being and another human being is universal. And that scene, to me, could have been a girl and a guy, a guy and a guy. It, it wasn't mm -hmm. specific to, these people are gay, so this is why I'm going to tell this story. Or this, you know, it was very much like about that, about unrequited love, no matter who you are. And you can't avoid the truth in it. Mike, I really want to kiss you, man. At that time, there was a lot of criticism about, you know, sort of showing flawed gay characters and um, instead of, you know, showing sort of more self-reliant, successful gay characters. And that's only really starting to happen now. Just people who really could be interchangeably gay or straight characters. Then it wasn't. I remember it was yeah. still a little, you know, taboo to even be bringing it up and especially meaningful mm -hmm. relationships like it's one yeah. thing to joke about it that was fun but this that's what I thought was so important too about the film is in some respects to me that's it was like a love story and it was also the search for yeah you know no, definitely his the love mother story. and uh, and so, so important for that time and so they went out on a limb in a sense to make they this did. film because they felt really strongly about the screenplay and what they wanted to say and I think that brought them really you know, closer together as friends mm -hmm. because 
when you kind of step out on a limb together, there's some camaraderie and some strength in that, and even in, in its uncertainness. You know? Yeah. And they've, they believed the same things and wanted the same things for the project. And yeah. ultimately, they got it. I think everyone They did. were so yeah. graceful, both of them, because you know, we couldn't have made the film without them the way that we made it. They were both essential elements. They were both, you know, insured. It was this, you know, for, it, for us to be able to make the film um, with Final Cut and completely autonomously like that depended on mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. If there was ever fear or anxiety, which there wasn't very much, but if there ever was, then they were both kind of like, oh, don't worry. <laughs> you know, right. Really help each other yeah through. reassuring well I mean and with us right. too like if we were scared about right. something or we thought something was going to go wrong they both because they had tons more experience than right. either Gus or I both of them had done many movies so they really mm -hmm. knew stuff that we didn't know and I think they really respected Gus so much his eye mm -hmm. for film you know mm -hmm. and well, I, you know, I'd seen Drugstore and and uh, Malanoche, and and I think they truly respected that, regardless that there was no safety net to tell them that it was okay to, and probably their agents were saying, don't. I you think know? they were. Yeah, yeah, were basically saying, don't do this. Ferociously. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they... They believed in it, regardless of all the naysayers, and, mm -hmm. and fought for it and believed in it all the way through and committed to it, and you can see it in the film. And the thing I feel like was different than I think almost any other film I ever worked on was um, the level of trust. I mean, I've worked on other films where there's a lot of trust between the actress and the director, but there was never a time where you felt like it wasn't safe mm -hmm. to just do exactly what was called for. Mm -hmm. I haven't ever experienced that completely again. River, he just had that with people. He didn't hold back trust. And yeah. Gus smiled mm -hmm. with, you know, he was just happy, I think, a lot. I do remember him smiling a lot, which is a really lovely mm -hmm. memory to have, is just Gus's adorable mm -hmm. face with the smile on it. And I think that's the thing that is the most different for me about films now, is that that kind of, um, the barrier of experience wasn't there. Mm. So just that complete innocence and happiness and mm. it was such a happy movie, wasn't it? Yeah. And even though it was about an incredibly sad thing, you know, about a, a boy trying to find his mother and being completely lost, it had this kind of sweetness about yeah. it. It was this great symbiotic relationship to watch just from behind the scenes and not really, you know, be working on it, but feel that love, like, that was there. Mm -hmm. It's a really cool and great time in my life. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's really, I guess my favorite thing about the movie is that, you know, we have him in it. Mm -hmm. Feels like we're in a movie or something. Fuck yeah. <laughs>